let's own it as a community. How does that sound? We don't need one MET 52 that came from Europe, by the way. Let's find one here. Look in the hives. Let's find them and turn them in. Remember, most wanted. <laughs> yep. So what do, you, do you, what do you think the likelihood of it um, becoming less target specific on the mice and targeting the bee, or do you think it's, it's focused on the class? Uh, it, it's, it's very, very unlikely it's going to target the bee. Uh, I've actually uh, I've actually found a honeybee was turned in by a good friend of mine uh, last Christmas, not the past one, but prior. Uh, he bought a, you know, colony collapse disorder is right. Or he just disappeared too. Well, why did they disappear? They ever figured it out? The uh, he was putting up his Christmas tree, which came from North Carolina, and in his Christmas tree was a fully mummified honeybee with ovaria. I mean, when he showed me that, and he goes, do you want it? I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Because it's an entirely different species. Right. Okay. But it's a Bovaria targeting a honeybee? I mean, that's like a weapon of mass destruction. So um, I have that one uh, stored away deep in my lab somewhere, and I don't even know what to do with it. It was just turned in. At least it's off the streets, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but that's uh, the maybe. Just by luck, he found something that maybe some of our bees are getting infected by other entomopathogens and they're flying away. Remember the behavior modification? Could, could be, right? So now we might need to have a, find a fungus that attacks a fungus. Boy. Uh, but that's good news for at least that we know that it exists. So be on the lookout, especially for the varroa mites. Uh, I think that's great. Remember, look for problematic insects and also look where they might be. All right, so some other things that uh, we're looking at now is um, bacterial pesticides. And uh, this evolved out of some research I did with human pathogens. Um, I told you what I got for my birthday, right? Yeah. Virgin fruit flies. <laughs> All right, so this was my Christmas present. I got E. coli, nice. salmonella, strep pyogenes, strep pneumoniae, Candida and Pseudomonas and Staph. All wrapped up with a little bow on it. Happy, well, Merry Christmas to me. Nothing like a Christmas present with a big biohazard sticker on that side of anything. <laughs> that gets me excited. Don't bring me flowers. Bring me pathogens. So this is a, this is a gallery just so you show how, um, how we're working on some of these things because, you know, um, this is biological warfare. So this is how we can create new biological pesticides too. Uh, I took, this is a shiitake fungus, and then uh, these are two pellets of E. coli, and I drop them down there. And this is what I call creating my gladiator matches, is what I call it. I usually do this on a Sunday when football's on or something. And within, you know, just a few days, your E. coli will swim, it's a flight response, there's the shiitake, and then all that white there is our dead cells. Those are lies, dead cells. So the shiitake is uh, perfectly capable of when it's confronting a biological threat, it's going to shift gears and it's gonna start sweating out toxins and molecules that target the specific bacteria, right? That's pretty cool, all right? It's creating its own biological weapons on demand like a factory. Like a vending machine is more likely. And it does it, it can do it within 24 hours. So we could use that technique just like I did with the human pathogens, is we're looking at plant pathogens. Have any of you ever had uh, powdery or downy mildew problems? Right? How about botrytis on strawberries? Yep. Sclerotinia root rot. It keeps going on and on. Some of these are, well, they're fungi. So fungi against fungi, sure, it can happen. Or what about bacterial problems? So this same technique we're actually looking at um, for, for livestock, we're looking at drug resistant strains because you know the pesticides, bugs and microbes become very resistant to chemical pesticides very quickly. They know how to adapt. But mechanically, the biological pesticides they have a very hard time with, because that is uh, um, that is behavior modification is what it is. 
These are living things going after each other, not an inert, mindless chemical. I like how it's called mindless. Right? So when, when I'm looking at um, taking 12 and a half years to create a novel antibiotic and two and a half years for drug resistance to occur, there's a major problem going on, right? And the more antibiotics we use on our plants and our, trust me, we're using antibiotics on our plants, <laughs> right? We need help. So just like the uh, taking a human biopsy, we can take biopsies from plants too, swab them and create those novel antibiotics. Let's say you have botrytis. Um, I can inject it onto this block here um, and let it sit. It sits on the back of this mushroom block that I've chosen, maybe to produce novel antifungal compounds. And then within 24 hours, you get this pool of liquid that can be diluted 10 to the six. So within 24 hours, you can get 528 gallons of a novel antifungal compound from one sample in your field. Seems like that might be the way to go. And you can produce this without a lab, in your home and in your farm, you know, or somewhere remote. I like that idea. So we do it with different pathogens. Uh, different mushrooms do different things. So that's why I have 250 mushrooms in my collection. It's not enough. There's four to 5,000 mushrooms in our area, even more. They all have different gifts. So maitake mushrooms, um, these are some prototypes we're working on. So I, uh, hopefully in a few years, we can make these where you would just buy the bag. As a farmer, you would take a swab of your infected tree. You would inject it into the pathogen port, hydrate the water reservoir, and within 24 to 48 hours, you can just pull this right out of the metabolite reservoir, right? There's your treatment. That's a patient-specific treatment for your tree, for your field, and it's bioregional too. It's not something that's coming from the West Coast or out of the country. You've made that. And this is how it works with fungi against fungi. Um, a lot of these are by accident. You know, uh, this actually happened when I was doing my fellowship at the EPA. I had contamination in the lab. I zipped up the plates and I threw them in the trash. And I went to Athens, Georgia for a week. I came back and I was emptying out the trash and I saw that. I saw the fungus attacking another fungus, another aspergillus, right? I saw it out of character. I saw it surging over the top of another fungus, and when I looked closer, I see little droplets. Do y'all see that? Mm -hmm. That's basically carpet bombing that other fungus with a novel antifungal compound that it was not making in pure culture. This is a mixed culture now. <coughs> so that's what's cool. Look at it. 24 hours later, it's completely bombarding that <laughs> with a novel antifungal compound. We could use this on our plants. This is coming. Too late, can't stop it. <laughs> it's in motion. Um, endophytes, like Mark was talking about. What about these fungal endophytes? That's why the worst thing you can do is to protect your plants, really, is to, I mean, that would have to be the nuclear option, right? Life or death to save that plant, but you're killing all the endophytes that are in the leaves. That's why seed saving is so important, too and not reproducing from clonal tissue. You're, you're losing the endophytes. The endophytes fight really hard to get up into these leaves. Do you know where they actually come from? They don't just land on them, some of them do. They come from the seed and that's brought forward. The plant encourages that endophyte to get up from the seed all the way up into the next generation. So it fights to get up into the seed for the next generation, endophytes are inside these seeds, and there you have it again. So it's perpetuated. Why is it that when seed saving, sometimes some seeds don't do very well, and some do amazing. They're pathogen resistant. They're insect resistant, aren't they, some of them? You should note that now, that it might not just be the genetics of the seed, there could be fungal endophytes to play here, all right? Now, what makes that, Plant medicinal now. Both. You follow? <coughs> both. Maybe both. I was at a, uh, the American Medicinal Plant Conference at Clemson, and there was a lot of students 
from all over the world presenting on how um, antibiotic holy basil was. And they all said, well, we planted these holy basil seeds and, you know, we surface sterilized the seeds and they all grew up and we tested them. And it was my turn to talk and I said, well, what about the fungal endophytes that were in the seeds? Did you quench those out? Maybe it was the fungal endophyte that was imparting the antibiotics. Who knows? And a riot ensued. <laughs> and then I left. <laughs> and I said, it's true. They're in there. How do you get rid of them? If you're going to do legitimate medicinal plant research, you better quench out those endophytes because you just don't know. Right? It's great that these plants are medicinal, but we're, we're, we're not seeing everything. This is multidimensional. So is it something like Mark suggested, the endophytes, that they're now putting entomopathogens pathogens into seeds or dusting the seeds with intimate pathogens that when the plant grows it imparts a mycopesticidal advantage it's got pesticides in the leaves it's crazy there's botrytis some of these were turned in uh, i've got samples of botrytis and some other pathogens from clemson don't send me any plant pathogens please <laughs> don't do it don't do that um, i've got plenty to work with but we're using the same technique. So we're looking for these for these uh, uh, sprays and protective attractants. Like what creates the environment for this fungus to attack these strawberries, right? Can another fungus help out by pure, pure exclusion? Can we put something there that holds down the bases, that holds down the fort so these fungi don't tunnel their way in, right? Or can we create a novel on-demand contact spray that would kill the botrytis and not the endophytes. You follow? We want to go after the problematic fungi, not all of them. Question? 20 years ago in Canada, they studied that botrytis control. All you needed to do was spray sugar and enhance the yeast, which made a out colonization. Gave good control of the other fungus. Yeah. Fungicide. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those are the kind of things we're looking at to do this year. I mean, we kind of, we focused on human pathogens with those, but now we're focusing on plant pathogens as well. Think about that too. I mean, par parasiticidal uh, fungi for livestock, goats. Anybody have goats? People worming goats? Terrible, right? It's a, some nasty stuff. Um, another situation was from one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Walker Miller who owns Happy Berry Farm up near Clemson. He, uh, he pretty much genetically mapped the uh, peach tree when uh, he was a professor there. Now he's retired. He owns uh, a vineyard and muscadines and grapes. And he said, Trout, you know, I'm having a very a, a terrible issue with botchosphaeria, all right? Does anybody have that or know what that is? And um, it really ruins the leaves too. And if the, the leaves aren't happy, the fruit aren't happy. You know, they're photosynthesizing. So I went out to his field and I said, you know, when you're trimming your branches, um, I need to come get some. So we pruned some of the branches off and then I put them in a blender and then I streaked some of that powder in my lab and I found uh, what's called a mycoparasite, which is trichoderma. Trichoderma is also used, it's the active ingredient in what's called root shield. Root shield protects roots from rot or really heavy, wet clay soil, okay? So it is a, um, it's hydrophobic, so it sweats the water away too. But it also attacks fungi. So I found a um, trichoderma growing in his vines that I streaked out. So I have his strain of trichoderma, not one that we bought. And then we grew that little green mold on tiny little matchsticks. Are, are any of you familiar with how to grow shiitake mushrooms? Little dowels, you drill holes and you put them in. So we grew the trichoderma on little tiny matchsticks and I gave it to him and he drilled, he tapped in the matchsticks at the base of the vine and up near the top where they start branching out. And in one year, he completely eliminated all the botchosphaeria from all of his fields using that one technique. It imparted a phytochemical uh, reaction and it started to, the, the, the mycopesticide now, the trichoderma was inside the vines as an endophyte. And he hasn't had to spray in years. I think it's been about three or four years. He hasn't had an outbreak yet. And now he was using systemic fungicides. You see, he's off of it. His plants aren't addicted to that anymore. So. 
um, 